Okay, let me just run through his profile. This one is a very big one. So Mr. Kennedy is the founder and CEO of Keeper Africa, a fintech startup revolutionary digital payment for small business in Nigeria. In other two, two years, Keeper has secured over 10 million US dollars. Hmm. I, I, let me just repeat that. 10 million US dollars from global fintech in investors, breaking ground in the industry with a background in management consulting at SNT, as Accenture, sorry. Kennedy's expertise drove him to lead usual acquisition and growth for TikTok's expansion. Hmm. Interesting. To Africa during his time in China. Kennedy's trailblazing accomplishments have been recognized with awards such as the Young African Leaders Fellowship from President Barack Obama and the Queen's Young Leader Award from Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II. Additionally, while attending the University of Calabar, he was called older for the highest rank competitive debater in Nigeria. Hmm. Mr. Kennedy was awarded the scholarship in China as well to attend Peking University in China with a master's degree in economics and management from the same university where he received the Distinguished Research Award. Hey, voila. He is passionate about unlocking social economy perspective in Africa and is inspiring other young people. I'm inspired too, I will not lie. Inspiring other young people to on the heart their potentials. The quest for continuity excel, to excel and impact on the scores Kennedy value through all his endeavors. Mr. Kennedy, good morning once again. And it's a lovely morning. Let us meet you. Can you just tell us about your perspective now and before you start Keeper? Is it there with us? Hi, everyone. Um, it's really nice to be here today. Um, I'm sure you can hear me. Um, thanks for okay. thanks for the invite. And um, I'm always very happy to do things like this, to meet with other people. And um, when I met with Peter and he invited, I, you know, it was almost an overwhelming years from um, me and the team. So great to great to be here today. Um, to to get very specific on the question, um, Aisha, if you mind rephrasing the question, um, you know, okay. To just for clarity, so I'm sure I'm answering in a way that provides maximum value to everyone that's here. Okay, so let me just say, um, the question is, what is your perspective about life now and few years ago, before and after Keeper? <laughs> um, I mean, I'm older now. Um, I'm I'm 25 years old now. Um, I started wow. Keeper when wow. I was 20. You know, right before I turned 23, and um, I mean as 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 I'm sure everyone here knows, like these years are probably the fastest growth spots in everyone's life. Um, and for me specifically, there is just a lot of maturity. Um, you know, one thing I say a lot is when you're trying to build anything, especially a startup. I don't know if everyone in the room is trying to build a startup, um, but when you're trying to do something like that, um, the most significant aspect of you that is on earth that is your psychology. Right. So a lot of psychological questions that you've previously not asked yourself, um, you definitely get to ask yourself that it is impossible. I'll tell you this for free. It's impossible for you to attain any level of success if we do not fix the psychological barriers that exist. So mm -hmm. beliefs we have about ourselves, the perspectives we have about you know, the world um, and the perspectives we have about the things we can even do. Right. Um, so without that, there's absolutely no possibility of attaining any level of success. For me, for example, you know, it's so easy when you see certain people, you're like, wow, this person is so talented, but they would really struggle to make it. They would struggle so hard. And it's so easy to see now. It's almost like muscle memory. And in many ways, I try to think about that my, for myself, too. So what are all the ways in which I'm brilliant? But my attitude, my, you know, psychological outlook will prevent me from being successful and how do I need that in the world today? Um, so I'll say the past two years has definitely been one of expedited growth for me as an individual. Um, and in many ways, the belief in my own potential, the understanding of my own weaknesses um, and how to embrace, bring them together, improve where I can, um, but also ensure that I'm trudging forward in a manner that makes sense to me. Another thing I would say is also there is a redefinition of what success means to me. When you start mm -hmm. out at a particular place, 
getting mm -hmm. to you know the top of one mountain is, is success right but when you get to the top of that mountain you have to come up with a new picture for what success looks like for you mm -hmm. in a way that's mm -hmm. sustainable mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. So the reason why a lot of people have stalled growth at certain point, you know, we have one hit wonders who, you know, are brilliant and then they kind of fizzle out is because their definition of what success looks like stays very limited, never evolves. And as a result, they arrive too early. So the biggest mistake anyone can truly make in your life journey as an entrepreneur is arriving too early. Right. Okay, I have all of these things. I'm kind of cool now, right? Um, but you never get cool, and that's the point. Right, you never truly get cool, um, and um, it's easy to see when people, when people stop growing. Most a lot of times, especially early on in their journey, it's because they became cool too early. Um, and think about everyone who you know was cool, um, you know, maybe five, ten years ago. I don't know about you, but for me, everyone who I thought was cool in high school, I definitely do not think of them as cool right now. If anything, <laughs> quite the opposite. Everyone who I thought was cool, even five years ago. I definitely don't think of them as cool anymore. And, you know, same with entrepreneurs. Um, those who arrive too early have a cap on how much they can grow. Um, and that's just bad form. So yeah, those are some of the things I would say I've learned, have evolved, um, you know, since I I you know started working on Kipan. Um, hold on, Aisha. Hold on, Aisha, for a minute. Um, thank you so much, Mr. Kennedy. Frankly speaking, just while we are speaking now, I told myself that where we are going, we have reached, we have gotten to where we are going. For this conference, frankly speaking, all right, and I'm going to beg you in advance, Mr. Kennedy, you will have to please give us some time today, because you have even we've not even started, right? But you have hit on some major touch points. Yesterday, uh, one of the speakers yesterday said to us something uh, something around understanding seasons, right? That you know, and you just said it now. You hit a success at one level. And then you have to ask yourself questions again. How do we pivot from here? I know that, but we'll come back to that. Mr. Kennedy, I want you to speak on what you just mentioned, you know, limiting beliefs. Those things that hold men back, that hold people back, you know, from growing. Because it's one thing for me to even know that there's a limiting belief for me to fight it. A lot of people don't even know that they have these limiting beliefs in their minds. So first, how do we diagnose for these limiting beliefs? One. Second, how do we then, you know, pull them down? And let's also talk within the context of Nigeria. You know how things are within the country and all that. So how do we also lift ourselves from the Nigerian reality, you know, to then enter that mental space where we are playing, you know, within the global ecosystem? Mr. Kennedy, over to you, sir. Um, yeah, honestly, I, I, I wish the, I had a, a, a um, you know, a very direct answer to that question that works for everyone. But there's no one size fits all answer. To the extent that there's a one size fits all answer, um, it is it starts with you, and um, you know, like I said earlier, who you want to be. Um, you know, your individual vision of success is what's going to help you navigate the world. Um, to be very frank with you, so if you believe that you're someone who is poised to do things on a global scale, and not just believing it though, but mm -hmm doing the work that comes with that right it's very simple things the you know a lot of times what i see with budding entrepreneurs is i see someone who i know okay intrinsically this person could be a really brilliant person or is a really brilliant person but very simple things um we a lot of times miss out on the technicals technical is how to communicate right um you can very easily tell apart two people who have exactly similar ambitions have similar levels of you know drive um and creativity but simple things like how to communicate globe to a global audience how to communicate to people who are not from your culture um you know for example one simple thing is even how to be a funny person cross-culturally right mm -hmm. um how to be a funny person when you're not using jokes that are you know that are colloquial simple things like that is, is are so important that you mean that's what it truly means to have a personal identity that transcends your borders um, and it is so important to have that level of identity that transcends borders wherever you go, whether you're in an English speaking country or not, whether you're with people who speak your local language, who speak Pidgin, who understand you. Um, having that and keeping that consistent all the way through is critical. Um, you know, and then it's also for you, with the field that you're playing and what it is you're trying to do, how scalable is that, you know, across borders? If you're doing something that is very niche um, that doesn't allow you any opportunity for global visibility then the chances that you probably will have that um is is very limited um so yeah you 
you know, to, to contextualize the question in the Nigerian reality and how much despair there is for young people. I mean, that's so true and that's so real. Um, but the great thing about the world we live in today is you can actually be friends with people, be mentored by people who you've never met, who do not know your name and who you'll never meet, right? We have access to materials, we have access to the internet, we have access to YouTube. Basically, you can immerse yourself. You have access to books, right? If you do not immerse um, and inundate yourself in the experiences of other people who have come before you um, and who are also experiencing different experiences that you want to have, um, then there's no way you're going to become like them. And a lot of, you know, lived experiences and a lot of suffering we go through, which in many ways makes us feel like we're actually working hard because we are suffering. We can, you know, skip that part by simply just reading, by immersing ourselves in the knowledge other people are gathering, integrating it into our own lives and journeys, and expediting how quickly we can move, right? Um, so I think those are some of the simple, but not so simple, um, you know, ways to overcome, like, your local immediate context. And if your immediate context is killing you, if that's your family, if it's your friends, then leave. I'm dead serious, right? If you have a group of friends who you know, you don't really think you want to be like, right? If you're spending too much time with your family members, with your parents who, you know, you really don't. One of the biggest drivers for me is, I know I did not want to have the parent, the life that my parents had. Um, my parents are university professors. So, you know, that's reputable and, you know, very honorable people in many respects. But I know deep down, and I knew that I did not want to have the life that they did. And a lot of what that meant for me was I had to remove myself. I had to do things for it. A lot of times I had to not listen to them right um and so that's very important and if 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 a guilt trip is the price you have to pay for doing that then don't pick up the phone um that's what i'll say um thank you thank you so much that was profound uh let's go back a little bit mr kennedy let's go back you know because i believe that the secret of men you find in their stories right Let's start, you know, first from the story of your personal journey. You know, at what point did you discover that, you know, there was this entrepreneurial part of you? You know, was this secondary school? Was it in the university? You know, just walk us through your journey. You know, there's a lot to learn by right? just listening to people's personal stories. Please take us through that journey, sir. Yeah, um, I don't think people really just wake up and discover, oh, there's that part of me. Right? Usually when you discover it, you're already too far gone. This was the other way around where it's like, oh, you wake up, you discover that that's something you have, and then you decide to go and become one. A lot of times when you discover, you're already all the way in your neck deep, um, and it's something that happens in retrospect when you connect the dots. Um, so um, I think a lot of times it's wrong when people look for that spark of inspiration or that definition. It's really just stroking one's ego, right? Oh, yeah, like I think I am... An entrepreneur. I think I have all of this. I have this natural gift of being entrepreneurial. Like that's not. How, that's really not how it works. Like no one ever says that. Or at least no one who does anything meaningful on a long enough time scale. Um. So for me, it was never really a realization. I just know that I've always been very interested in, you know, doing creative things that give me energy. Um. And in, a lot of times, it manifests itself in micro and macro ways. Um. And you know, it's just pursuing that to its logical conclusion and seeing where that leads you. So there's an incredible amount of just letting go and pursuing, you know, what it is makes you tick. And, um, you know, I'll tell you the type of people who will definitely not be successful entrepreneurs. I don't know who, you know, I don't think there's a formula, and at least I do not, you know, from my limited experience, know the sort of people who will be successful ex um, entrepreneurs. Um, but I know those who will not, right? It's those who... um decide a priori before they even start the journey um you know create mental fancy images of what sort of entrepreneur they want to be and how many personal assistants they want to have um you know without thinking about what it is they're truly interested in it's also those who um do not have any sort of skin in the game um when it comes to creative endeavor it's those who have absolutely nothing in their lives that they would do um, if there's no money involved, right? Um, or, you know, they would not do if there's no money involved. Um, so those sorts of people do not make good entrepreneurs and um, 
you know. So a lot of times when people come to me, oh, will you be my man? It's so easy to kind of take them apart um, and figure out what the true intentions of people are. Um, so I think that's very important. Okay, thank you for that. Okay, I, I want to ask also, what is journey like to Young African Leaders Fellowship and um, the Queen's Young Leader Fellowship as well? What's the journey like? Can you just share your experience, how you got it, how you got the information to, to be part of the program and how is it now? Um, so how I got the information, to be frank with you, I don't remember exactly. Um, but I know for sure it came from people in my network. So friends, especially those who have done those programs before. Um, and um, I'm sure that's how I applied to them. But I don't think exactly remember the details now. As it's been a few years. Um, but what I would say is when you think about those, those are sorts of like things that you pick up along the way, um, you know, and not necessarily the, the purpose of, why you you should even do the things you're doing in the first place they are really nice to be honest with you right and um you know the things that come with them the sort of attention the credit relative credibility and um, because i won't say it's absolute credibility that comes with with those are really nice and it feels really good um but we realize that after the first few weeks it doesn't feel as good anymore and you're kind of back to baseline levels um of how you feel so um you know the truth is what stays with you um, you know, after all of, you know, the awards and the glamour and the press um, is sort of who you've become along the journey. Um, and anyways, I think those sorts of things know how to find those who, um, you know, are sort of the, the best in class people um, and stay with them. And anyone, everyone who I know um, has their self-purpose trying to, um, you know, get shiny objects along the way. They don't really do it very well for long um, or usually like they'll probably just be one hit wonders and won't do anything sustainable um, over an extended period. Um, so, um, but yeah, it's it's mostly through, so to be very specific um, with answering that question, it's mostly through people who are in my networks. I think it's just important, right? Because I think I've surrounded myself with people who um, are similarly interested in things I am. Um, and so the, there is, there is just an ambient where opportunities tend to, you know, freely distribute themselves amongst people like that. Um, and if you're there and if you're part of that, then, you know, they sort of will come to you over time. Um, but your, you, the, the sort of tickets that admit you um, into circles like that is just sort of who you're trying to become um, along the journey and the credibility of those intentions. Okay, so in simple words, it's just your network is your network. So yes, we just have to, to have lots of people that will help us, will help us improve. Yeah, that's that will help us, uh, our, our company that we want, we should just gather ourselves with lots of people that have the idea, that have, that have gone through it. So quick one. So I've, I've been reading, like, I've been trying to go back to your profile and why philosophy? Is it, did you just, stumble on it or it was just um let me just do philosophy as my first degree and then um, fintech came in and management came in can you just take us through philosophy management and the likes of your career till now um so to be frank with you there's no those were not very you know it wasn't like a long-term decision that i um well, it wasn't the decision that I knew um, far out in advance that I was going to pursue, right? It sort of made sense at the very time where I had to make those decisions. And in hindsight, I'm super grateful for them. Um, you know, for me, the the most important thing with um, studying philosophy, because when I, when, when I studied philosophy for, you know, all four years of my undergrad degree, it also coincided with me being a competitive debater. Right, and both of them kind of walked hand in hand because it was really cool. I'll be in class till like 3 p.m. and learn like all of these new fancy ethical principles. When I go for the big practice at three o'clock, um, it'll be like a testing ground for me to, you know, use them and one up other people. And it, it, it was just really nice. It was a way to sort of, you know, practice. I, I didn't have to study that much because I mean, a lot of my studying was, you know, applied when I was debating. So um, I thought that was a very unfair advantage for me both ways. 
you know, it was like a positive feedback loop where debating made my study better and my study made my debating better, um, you know, for all four years. So I really enjoyed that time period. Um, yeah, and I, I think the most important thing that studying philosophy for four years bequeathed me with is the ability to think from first principles. Um, and what that does, it allows you sort of be a very curious person um, and apply that irrespective of what field, um, domain you find yourself and you, you know, sort of have to engage in. Um, with decision to study economics in grad school, I, you know, for me, it was one that was born out of some sort of insecurity. I was very embarrassed by how little knowledge of economics I had. Um, and then I went to study economics and actually found out that no one really knows anything about economics, um, right? So, um, yeah, that was that was the reason why it also was not with any sort of long term ambition in mind. I really did not know where it was going to go, um, or why that was going to be helpful for me. Um, but yeah, that was that was the reason why I decided to study that. Perfect. Thank you, um, Aisha. Hold on, um, uh, Mr. Kennedy. Now let's go. I mean, the reason we had to dig a bit into your personal life, really, is just to understand your journey, right? To understand, you know, what makes Kennedy tick? What, you know, how does his mind work? You know, what kind of principles can we adopt? You know, just listening to Kennedy's story. And now that we've heard, you know, uh, some of them, I want us to now dive into the professional uh, part. Please talk us through, you know, people as a brand, you know, your startup. You know, what led to that? Um, um, you know, just talk us through, you know, the the, in, the initial points of Keep Up When It's Static and how you bootstrap. Did you ever bootstrap? Um, what was the journey like? Was there ever a struggle or has it been all rosy, rosy from day one? You know, please just talk us through that journey. I mean, it's never been. It's never been. And I don't, it still is not to, today for sure. Um, you know, of course, outside in, it's easy to think that it is, um, you know, that it's rosy, but absolutely not. Um, and, you know, I think that's very important for me as I, you know, just continue to share part of, you know, my journey with with people externally to, to do that in a way that's bullshit free, right? Um, mm -hmm. So that's very, very, very important to me. Um, I've talked about this on a bunch of, you know, other, you know, interviews um you know how how we got started but there was you know from my experience the way most companies get started is not an aha moment that you figure out when you're you know in bed and you decide to go build it and it turns out to be a company right that's absolutely not how most companies get started a lot of them get started in very weird ways um, one of the most common ones which was also true to us is people decide that they want to um you know pursue new paths in their life and they now go need to figure out what to spend time working on. Um, and a lot of times it is get a look through their interests um, and, you know, just sort of permutate all of their interests and find, you know, where something really sticks, right? And you probably would have to go through various iterations of that. Um, and that's no different to how we, we started to build Kipa. Um, when I moved back to Nigeria from Beijing, just right at the start of the pandemic, um, you know, I decided that I was going to be an entrepreneur. Um, and my, my co-founders and I made that decision. So we moved to Uyo, um, the capital of Akwaibom. And we lived there for 18 months, so all through the pandemic. And in that time period, we really tinkered around with a bunch of different things. Um, you know, worked on um, and built and shaped quite a number of different things that didn't really stick. First thing we worked on was a software recruiting startup for um, early stage companies in the US. We had a lot of friends who um, were going through Y Combinator with that very early stage. And we're going to India, um, you know, Latin America to hire talent. And we thought, okay, you know, there could be a way for us to help them do that from Nigeria. Worked on that for about six months. Um, and I mean, it was profitable, um, but it, did, it wasn't growing as quickly as we wanted it to. Um, and it also did not feel like that's something I wanted to spend my time working on. So, you know, with the money we made from that, um, we were able to have the flexibility to just sort of tinker around, right? For context, we decided to move to Aquaibon because we needed to cut back on expenses very drastically. Um, and so our salaries for that 18 month period was we paid ourselves 50,000 naira every month um, for that time period. Um, and it was just enough for us to, you know, like 
do basic things like get groceries and you know yeah just because there was nothing for us to spend money on anyways um at the time and we we're not traveling or anything um and during that time period like i said we you know use that capital put it to very efficient use um you know we had to every now and then hire an engineer on contract to sort of work with us um you know to build and ship um and eventually we decided that we were going to try to take a different approach what we did was we started to travel um across the country um by bus um to meet small business owners to just figure out okay what are the challenges the experience and how can we um learn from those challenges and hopefully figure out an idea to build a startup around um and you know we went to onisha we went to Aba, um we came to lagos we went to calabar you know we talked to a bunch of merchants in Uyo, um and from all of those i mean we saw businesses struggling with their end of day accounting um and at the same time simultaneously there was this significant wave of you know startups in other emerging markets that had similar demographic um um trends to Nigeria, um, building to digitize small businesses. And so we cold emailed the founders of these companies. We got on the phone with them just to learn more about the challenges they experienced building in their local markets. And after that, we felt very confident, um, you know, about building for, for our local markets. Um, yeah, that's how, that's how we decided to build an MVP. Um, and, you know, that's really how Keepa was birthed. So definitely not a straightforward, um, you know, aha moment. And then Wait, moving forward. You, you, mean, you mean to tell me, Kennedy, that uh, somewhere in your journey, you have struggled before, looking like this, with all your amazing profile. Sorry, what did you say? I said, you mean to tell me that you have struggled before, looking like this, with an amazing profile as well, like you ever struggled? Well, um... You know, I'll, I'll tell you it's a short but funny story in that regard. When I was living in Beijing, one of my very good friends, um, Valeria, she's from she's from Bulgaria. Um, I was struggling to learn Mandarin, so she's very fluent in Mandarin, and um, so she I I you know message her and trying to learn a few words, come down and help me. And I was really struggling. I think I'm bad at learning new languages. So I just I'm not that interested. But I had a test to study for in Mandarin. Um, and so she's like, it feels good to finally see you struggle with something. I was like, God, you're so stupid. That's just, that's, that's, that means you just don't know me um, at all. Um, but yeah. And again, that, that, you know, that ties back to what I said earlier, um, you know, that there needs to be bullshit free conversations about, um, you know, what it means to, and I, I think of course it serves people when you can shroud success in the veneer of obscurity. Right, and make it seem like you're, you know, there's something so special about you or so grand and good. But you know, it's all so it's all, it's all smoke and mirrors. There's there's very little um that differentiates person A from person B, mm -hmm. to be honest, right? Um and so I think telling the story is very honestly so important and it's probably not done enough. Hmm. Hmm. Wow. I um I don't know about every participant right now. My head is exploding. So I'm going to take a pause now. Um, Aisha, I'm sure you're still there. Let's just take one or two questions from you know people in the conversation. Can you, can you hear me? Yes, loud and clear. My network. All right, no, it's fine. It's fine. I got you. Okay, so if you've got anything to ask uh, Kennedy, you know, you know the rule of the of the, you know the rule of engagement. Just raise your hand. You know, use the Zoom app. Just raise your hand. Would we'll call you, and of course. You know, you would unmute and shoot your question. So while we are waiting to take questions from, you know, from the participants, now, Mr. Kennedy, take us through from the story, right? You started, there was, this is literally three years that since you started. So between three years and now, you have done all of this funding. Now, that is a, prod a prodigy in itself. That's, you know, it's not the norm. It's an outlier kind of success. Don't you think so? Would you agree? Please unmute yourself. Sorry, the mic was muted, but I said statistically, yes, it is. Yes, exactly. Now, what do you think is responsible, you know, for that? What, what do you think is responsible for that amount? Of course, yes, you had your struggles and all that. But then again, 
2020 post COVID, right? 2020, 2023 keeper with over 80,000 followers on Instagram, you know, with many others, you know, across different social platforms. But even leaving social engagement, financially speaking, over 10 million U US dollars in the bag, you know, what is responsible? What would you say is responsible for this incredible, incredible growth within such a short time? Um, yeah, I think I think it's a couple of things. Um, the the timing of the markets, um, you know, for sure. Um, there is there's not that many markets right now in 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 Africa with potential to build, you know, like say fifty billion dollar business, right? At full scale, um, there's very few of them, and I think building for small businesses is one of them. Um, and so I think that's a very important critical. Um, back on to be honest um i also think it was all there's also a global wave of you know what's interesting where's the most potential um and there's this sort of narrative that um is pervasive globally of africa being the last frontier um and so those who missed out on you know markets like india china you know don't want to miss out on this market so i think that's that's incredible and you know the i'll say the last bit is also just overall like credibility so credibility is when people trust you. Um, and I mean, there is there is not that many, if you talk to the best venture capitalists, right, they'll tell you there's way more capital chasing few people. Um, and this is true in more developed markets, um, but in developing markets, it's even harder because the, the bar for what it means to trust is a lot higher. Um, and so that personal credibility aspect of things also ties very deeply. Mm. Hmm. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Kennedy. Um, I will now go straight, you know, to the funding journey, right? Um, so please talk to us, you know, talk us through the funding journey. There are lots of startups in this room, and this, you know, meeting is also being recorded. It's going to be played, you know, across different uh, media. Uh, so please talk to us through, you know, the funding journey. How were you able to, you know, seal the deal? Please just talk, us, and please hold nothing back. You have the floor. We are here. Even if you take us 10 hours, we are here. Please talk us through it. Um, I one thing um, you know, Shala, the CEO of Face that told me was the very early because I had a opportunity to speak to Hian um as right his co-founder in 2020. Yeah, he's like, you know, focus on trying to build something and investors' job is to find good companies. And you know, that is there's nothing more true than that when it comes to how you deal with investors um it's one of those things where the more you try to get specific things the more it dilutes you um right and fundraising is one of those um and first it's i'll you know very frankly the first time we um we even we, we did not intend to go out and catalyze the process we were still neck deep trying to figure out what our mvp would be and onboard our first users and this was in the second quarter of 2021 um and an investor who could not because we didn't have anything up on LinkedIn, we didn't even have a name for the company mm. right um an investor went to the okay no we had a name we had released a landing page um and our investor found first investor founders was he went to the privacy policy um sent an email to the the email address it was something like privacy at skipper.africa something like that i don't remember what it was now like oh i'm trying to get connected to the founders um you know and that was an email that went on money dot we were really looking at it we just set it up because we had to put a privacy policy out there and it was like weeks later we saw that and you know i now replied and i realized he had actually sent me a message on twitter because i don't use twitter that much um you know a few weeks before around when he did and i got on the phone with him after speaking with him he sort of you know, and in the venture community, it's really it's a really small world globally. It is very, very, very small community, right? So what gets around really fast, and that's why personal credibility is also super important. Um, so you know, he shared you know our story with a bunch of other funds, um, you know, that reached out to us inbound, and that was sort of how you know the process got, um, you know, got catalyzed. So I think that's just a very stellar example of focus on what you're doing and the people who are supposed to find you will find you. Um, and if you do not have, I think this is, you know, again, it is, it's weird advice, but if you don't have at least one person saying what you're doing is kind of interesting, um, let's talk more. Um, 
it means you are either not networked enough and that's a red flag. If you're trying to build something and you're not networked enough, it's never going to get off the ground ever, right? Um, or what you're building is not interesting enough, especially for the venture capital model. I think there are a lot of great ideas. Um, I do think personally that we need more traditional lifestyle businesses than we need venture capital businesses, right? I think our market is still a little early for the venture capital model, um, to be frank with you, and it sounds hypocritical um, from someone who's built and is backed by venture capitalists. Um, so I do not think the the bar for everyone here who is thinking about or trying to be an entrepreneur should be to, you know, okay, raising venture capitalists. It is not the, the marker for success. Again, I'm sure we hear this so many times, it may sound hypocritical, and it's easy for me to say that, right? But it's not the bar for success. Um, and the bar for success is, A, getting a business off the ground that makes money, keeping your costs lower than, you know, your, your revenue, and then growing your, your revenue over time, right? That's a business. And, um, you know, if it's one that is able to scale very quickly, then that's great. Um, you know, the other side of raising venture capital is the expectations are very steep. Um, the, the implicit assumption behind the venture capital model is between five to 10 years, you should be able to exit for a billion dollars, right? So what that means is for Kipa, our time is ticking, right? Um, and what that means for you as a founder is you're definitely under pressure, right? How you communicate what you communicate. If you've raised 10 million, expected to at least 10x that. So you're expected to at least sell for, you know, you know, 100 to 200 million um, if you sell. Um, and with every additional dollar you raise, times it by 10, that's how much you're expected to return. Um, so it is not something that, um, you know, anyone should sort of just, you know, do because it's kind of nice when you read it on TechCrunch. And I mean, if any of you are reading tech, TechCrunch these days, you're seeing how much a lot of us, a lot of startups are suffering, uh, you know, because of the boom that happened that year. So that's something that you want to think about before you, you know, before you sort of do. All right. Uh, thanks for that, uh, Kennedy. Amazing and profound story. Um, I'm a startup, right? And I don't necessarily have the kind of um, same network that a Kennedy has, right? I am a startup in Benin. I am a startup in Calabar. I'm a startup in Kano. I'm a startup in, 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 you get the drift, right? What would you say? What kind of counsel would you give to me in terms of, you know, trying to raise funds? What, you know, just speak generally that if you're a startup, you know, it may not be a one size fits all, but these are the pointers, these are things to do. These are the kind of, you know, processes to invite and it can, you know, it might help you uh, to raise your funding. Yeah. Yeah, um, I mean, even when you say that, I don't think of instead of being in any of these places as a disadvantage, right? Um, I grew up in Calabar. I, you know, we started building our startup in Uyo. Um, you know, we raised our entire pre-seed round when we lived in Uyo. Um, and it was an it weren't just random. We we intentionally decided to move ourselves out there. So where you are has absolutely this. If anything, I think the more remote you are, the better for you. The better for your focus. The better for your energy. The better for your expenses. Um, you know, it allows you even disproportionately become more successful. To be frank, so um, I don't. When you think about it, what's actually the practical value of being in? Except you have a team that's located in a central place like Lagos, um, I, there's absolutely no value because, I mean, a lot of people say, oh, the community, but when we say community, what exactly do we mean when we say community? Do all startups leave and work from the same place? How many times in a, in a year do you meet with other people? And even when you do for drinks, what, what exactly does that mean? How many business transactions come out of that? Most business transactions come out of you picking up the phone and talking to people. Um, so I think that's very important and we should, we should, Think through some of these things for ourselves and challenge some of these assumptions. Um, and that's the only way you can make decisions like, okay, I'm going to move myself out of here and move to this place for the sake of my own focus. Um, so that's very important. Um, and with, with network building, um, right, that's something that comes when you pour into yourself, when you point to building your own credibility, when you point to just making yourself, look, the way it works is people want to back people who they think are going to be successful. Right. Um, no one wants to be, it's a weird way to put it, but no one wants to be responsible for your success. They want to be a part of your success. So for a lot of people, it is this person, whether or not I'm involved in their journey, I know they are going to go on to be very successful. 
So for me, and a lot of times you see the thing of ego, right? I want to be associated with this person. I want to say, oh, I met them when they were young and just starting their journey and I was an early believer. I do something for them. And that's exactly how it works with mentors, with friends, with colleagues, um, you know, with investors. They want to be a part of an individual's journey who they know whether or not they're involved in it, that person is going to go on to be successful. So that's exactly what I mean by no one wants to be responsible. No one, no one wants to take that risk to be like, if I don't help you, you're not going to succeed. Um, because honestly, a lot of people aren't that brave. Um, and I think the least brave set of people I've ever met are investors. Most of them actually aren't brave people, right? They are scared people, especially scared when they're investing in new markets. And um, so they don't know how to make decisions for themselves. And they are looking to you to guide them and teach them and show them that whether or not you come on board my journey, I do not need you. I'm going to go on to be a successful person. Um, so that mindset has to be there. Kennedy, I've been screaming here. Just that I'm muted, you can't hear me, right? I've been screaming, wow. What? You know what? I'm just going to take a break. Hey, guys, you've got a question, something. Let me take it now. I know some hands have been raised. We still have a ton of questions. Please, Kennedy, today that we have you. We will, we will get as much <laughs> as we can, please. Yes, questions. I saw some hands raised. Real quick, real quick. Yes, uh, Z uh, pardon me if I don't get that name correctly. Zain Zainul Labidin. I'm sorry if I didn't get that right, but I'm sure you got it. Please unmute yourself. Ask your question. Zainul Labidin, thank you so much for having me here. Mm -hmm. My name is Zainul Labidin Abdulaziz. You can call me Zain. So my question to Mr. Kennedy is that... Uh, as an early stage startup, what is the right way to market your your startup? For example, what is the best right way to start marketing to put your startup out there so that people can see what you are doing and uh, know what you are doing and patronize you? Thank you so okay, much. Okay, so you mean in terms of your customers, correct? Yeah. Hmm. Um. Maybe I ask I'm you. Sorry. If, I'm if, sorry. If, would you also expand that? to also include yeah. investors. So how do I begin to market, like he asked, to customers on one side, and on the other side, is there anything as investor marketing? I don't know, I don't know. Is there anything as that? I mean, there's, 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 there's definitely some element of that, right? Mm -hmm. um, but it's probably not marketing in traditional sense um, when you think about it. Um, what it involves is, like I said, you existing deeply in networks and those people in your networks knowing you, vouching for you, um, and in many ways that takes wings on its own. So you don't have to, the more, it's almost like you, the, the more effort you put into trying to, um, you know, market, um, you know, the worse returns you get because it makes you seem suspicious. Um, so yeah, a lot of times when people try so hard to market in that sense, it is it's symptomatic of just like absence of, a network of people who know you trust you can vouch for you and maybe you should be spending more time developing that network of people um, as i think that's incredibly important um in terms of marketing to customers right there's no straightforward way and you know it's something that a lot of us are still you know everyone is still still learning um you know but what i'll say is at the pro at the point where you're ideating and i'm sure there's a set of people who you talk to who you went out to um to validate your idea against Right, the best place to start to market to is those people. When you have what it is you've built, whether it's a service, whether it's a product, you know, you go back to them, oh, this thing I talked to you about, look, I've built it. I want to sign you up as a user. Whatever you can do, whether it's onboarding them for free, giving them discounts, treating them specially, you know, doing things that don't scale, adding them to WhatsApp groups, calling them every day. Um, those will be your initial set of customers. And once you have an initial set of customers, especially if you make them happy, then you almost don't have to think about the growth problem because what you'll now do is figure out ways to get them to refer that people to join. Um, and you know that sort of organic spread will start to happen. Um, and then at some point, you probably will have the capital to invest more in marketing, maybe hire a marketing person, you know, to do things like paid marketing, growth marketing, um, you know, performance marketing for you to, to get more customers. Um, but I'll say for the stages that you're in, you don't have to worry about that for sure. You have to worry about just getting those initial set of people who would even try out what it is you're, you know, you're, you're building for them. Mm. Mm. Profound. 
Thank you for that. I, I understand that you've got another meeting to jump into. Yes, Kamsi, I hear you. Uh, but I'm just going to take an extra max two, three minutes, all right? Uh, we've got 10 more minutes. We might, you know, just take an extra 10 and uh, two, three minutes. All right. Uh, someone's hand is ready. Kifaya, Kifaya, go ahead. Unmute yourself. Shoot straight. Yeah, good morning. Thank you. My question for Kennedy is, um, what's your view about entrepreneurship in general? Do you think every youth has what it takes to be a successful entrepreneur? So in other words, do you think entrepreneurship is inborn or something anyone can learn with persistence? Ah, God. Um, that's a, that's a um, I don't know how to even start with the question, but what I, do I think everyone has what it takes? Absolutely not. Um, and as a matter of fact, that's not an ideal state of affairs. I don't think everyone should. It is not a net good if everyone does, right? Um, is it something you're born with? I don't know. Um, I really do not know, right? Because, again, I think there is this veneration of the idea of what it even means to be entrepreneurial or to be an entrepreneur. And um, it's one that doesn't sit very comfortably with me, especially when that comes with some sort of elevation to hero status of people who are entrepreneurs, um, right? You have to understand that they are not very different from you. Maybe they are just less afraid of risk because for the most part, they have nothing to lose, right? So even if they lose, you know, they're back to square zero and everyone is at square zero anyways. Um, so that's probably the only thing that differentiates folks, um, you know, from, from folks who are entrepreneurs from, from, from every other person. So to that extent, I don't think that is something that we can say, oh, people have innately existing in them. Um, there are many environmental factors that shape that, um, which I'm sure you know already. I don't need to go into outlining what those are. Um, and yeah, that's that's what I think. Um, thank, thank you. you. Yes, thank you for that, um, Kennedy. Now, Kamsi, I see you. Uh, so what we're gonna do, you know, we're gonna be sharing this video. So we're gonna tag Kennedy's personal page so that, you know, there are questions, unfortunately, that we're not able to answer all through, you know, because of the timing, you know, constraints. But I'm gonna ask you some very specific questions, Kennedy, before we leave. First, you said something very profound. Because I was muted, I was generally, generally, I was just screaming, right? Part of the things you said is that, <laughs> Jesus, you said, Kennedy, and I said Kennedy, uh, investors are not necessarily the bravest of all, right? They are this, they are that. Now, that for me kind of demystifies the whole investor's myth. You know, because if I start up looking for money, investors are a god. They are some special angels that you must worship every day and night. So speak more about that. You know, talk to us more about how to understand the internal workings of investors, how to engage them the day you find, you know, just talk a bit more on that, Kennedy. Yeah, um, that's something that's evolving and, you know, in many ways I'm still learning. But I think key to answering that is also understanding the like venture capital as an asset class and what the business model is, All right? The business model is um, investors find companies, businesses that they think will have the potential to generate outsized returns in the next five to 10 years. Simply what outsized returns means is they are betting that if they invest in you now, you'll grow enough that in the future, someone else would invest in you um, and mark the investment up. So what it means to mark the investment up is investing you at a higher valuation. Um, and what that means is, is they've essentially increased the value of their, you know, the, their worth in you and that your, your price per share goes up over time. Um, so that's, that's simply the business model. Um, and when you think about that and you go to investors too, you know, ask for money um, or to try to raise money. Um, at its core, they want to believe that you're someone who understands and believes that you can grow in 10 years, right? And that, that what, what it is you're building can become that in 10 years. So that's why they check for things like the market. You know, does the market you're building in, can it support a business of that size and magnitude? Um, you know, the founders, the team, um, you know, regulatory, um, constraints um, and you know things like that that we we, we probably already know. Um, so going in with the mindset that there's a particular set of people who are got is absolutely wrong. Mm -hmm. um, I think it also comes from 
you know, the best entrepreneurs, I like, think of the most successful ones, you know, the Zuckerbergs, the Elon Musks and everyone, they, that's, that's definitely not how their journey started. Um, and the best entrepreneurs I know who aren't as successful as those people, or who I think are really, really, really good quality entrepreneurs, there's tends, there's, there tends to be a belief in, their, their, in themselves and like, you know, the availability of options. So options, i.e., well, if you're not going to invest in me, someone else will. Um, you know, even if no one is willing to invest in me, then, you know, I'm probably going to find a way to do it. Um, and even if all of this doesn't work, like I have options and I'm still going to go on, you know, to be really successful at whatever it is, my wherever it is, my interest directly. So that level of self-confidence in, you know, no matter what this is, I'm going to be all right. I'm mm. going to be fine. Um, you know, that is... That is that mm. is that is so important. That's mm. so important, and it's easy to recognize that. And like I said earlier, people already want people want to get behind the train that is moving already. They don't want to be the ones to sort of you know crank the engine to see if it will start or not. They want to see the engine like moving in some ways, and they are sure that if they put that capital, that's mm. fuel in the engine, that would make it move yeah. faster. But mm. with or without their fuel, the engine, you know, that that train is going to move anyways. Um, so, yeah. Wow. Um, I don't know about every other person in this room right now. For me, I'm having a blast. I'm, I'm just having a blast. Okay. Ooh, we have questions. We have lots of questions. But Kennedy's got to go. So, Tega, I'll take your question in a minute. I'll take your question in a minute. But quick one about Kennedy. There's a popular saying that says, uh, sincerely, people are already saying, thank you, Kennedy. I mean, thank you. We can't even wonder. That, uh, what do you say when thank you is not enough? <laughs> thank you. But quick question. Um, 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 there's a popular saying that when opportunity, when preparation meets opportunity, success is guaranteed, right? So what's your advice around preparing for investments? Imagine that tomorrow I run into an investor in an elevator. I run into an investor on the street, right? What do you advise that we should already have handy so that the day an investor asks for it, you're already, you know, you are prepared. What are those, is it, doc I mean, I don't know, just talk us through, you know, those things that you just must have somewhere in the bag, somewhere on your phone, you know, such that the day the opportunity arises, you are good to go. Oh well, yeah, I mean, there's basic things that I'm sure you'll find if you just do a simple Google search, right? Um, you know, your, your executive summary, you know, the depth describing your business, the ability to articulate what it is, um, you know, comp like incorporation documents, legal documents, um, you know, financials. So that means you act actually have to, you know, do a decent level of bookkeeping, um, you know, even from day one, right? Understand um, how to document that. You can get that. If you have a friend who is an accountant, you know, get them to look over your account statements and help you put that together. You don't need to hire one, especially if you're very early on. Um, but ensuring that you keep those documents, you know, clean is super important, you know, data. So whether that's customer data, um, especially customer data, actually, um, you know, storing that in a way that's secure and safe um, and accessible um, and, you know, specific dashboards that analyze that data, whether it's manually created using, Google, um, you know, Google Sheets, Microsoft Excel, um, you know, all of those are very important to have on hand. And, you know, yeah, from, from the top of my head, those are things that I, you definitely will need for whatever process or conversation is that you're going to. Mm, perfect. Tega, quick, your question. OK, thank, thank you, um, Mr. Kennedy. Yeah, thank yeah. you, too. Yes, a quick one. Um, is there a business school that deals with all of this um, setup that needs to be in place, from legal to accounting to marketing to sales to internet to pitch deck? Um, which, you know, um, the um, host, you know, recently touched on, that's one. Two, um, there's, a, there's a popular saying that says a man think it, so he is. And you've made mention of um, your psychology, right? Um, and then, of course, um, knowing about economics, right? So if you were to recommend books, for instance, let's say about three to five, that helped you in engaging entrepreneurship and deciding that this is what you want to do full time, right? What would they be? Um, lastly, for a case study, for instance, we have electricity as a major issue. Without electricity right now, 
none of us is going to be here. I mean, all of this is not going to be working. So let's say there's, um, when I said case study, there's a solar implementation that is on ground. And um, of course, you've spoken to the market, but then the market is not, um, the people need money um, to pay for all of this installation. So um, how do you go about that? Especially when if you, you cannot afford to do a demo because these installation equipments are quite expensive, right? Because you talked about local market, building local market from small businesses and on, you know, the local demands. Yeah, so that's, those are my questions. Thank you. Yeah, um, and this is the last one I'll take because I have to go um, at 11. But I, um, the last question as I don't have an answer for it and that's why, you know, you're an entrepreneur and you have to figure it out, right? There are all of these difficulties you have to surmount and, you know, you're the best. And that's why you get rewarded if you do that successfully at scale, um, right? So I, I really don't know what the answer to that is. It's very specific on your business and I don't have all the details. And, you know, you kind of have to figure out the way to do that creatively. Um, in terms of books, um, there are three I recommend to you that I think are really interesting. Um, they're very specifically applied to entrepreneurship, but also have very important lessons for for life at large. Um, the first one is The Hard Thing About Hard Things. It's by Ben Horowitz, his um, partner and founder of Anderson Horowitz, one of the most reputable um, venture capital funds in the world. Um, the next is a book called um, Shoe Dog by Phil Knight. Phil Knight is the founder of Nike. Um, he founded Nike, I think, in 1976. And um, the book just chronicles his journey to finding Nike, um, the journey and specifically around branding for, you know, how Nike has grown to become this brand that is synonymous with sports today. Um, and the third one is a book by Peter Thiel, the founder of a company called Founders Fund, first investor in Facebook, titled Competition is for Losers. Um, so yeah, those three books. Um, I also have a newsletter um, where she advised from books I read. So, um, you know, as a, for anyone who is curious about what it is I'm reading, um, please feel free to sign up to that. It's kennedyakazia.com slash newsletter. Um, and you read from me every week. Perfect. Perfect. Man, uh, we cannot say thank you enough, Kennedy. We understand that you have to go now. Um, 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 what we're going to do is that in our email to you, we will put all of these together. We'll put Kennedy, uh, Kennedy's uh, personal newsletter link in our next email. So that you know you can subscribe directly, you know, and hear directly uh, from Kennedy. Then also we're going to be putting, yes, yes, I see that Alatunji. We are going to also, you know, the title of the books, the three titles of the books, we'll get them across to you. If we can even find the soft copies, we'll find a way to email, you know, those to you as well. All right. Um, um, then of course, you know, this is going to be shared on all our social handles. There are still lots, lots of questions. There are still lots of questions. Unfortunately, you know. Uh, timing, you know, is everything. We don't have all of that time, but we've got to say a big thank you to Kennedy for your time today. This has helped. Please, everybody, unmute yourself, do something, type some, just, let's just appreciate Kennedy, everyone, please. Thank you. Thank you so, thank you. so, thank you. so much, Kennedy. Thank you. Of course, thanks everyone. Thank you, sir. We are going to be inviting you more. Before you go, we are going to be bringing more invitations, please. Both physical and happy. So please expect to hear from us. Thank you. Thank you, Kennedy. Thank you. Thank you. Have a good one. Woo! Okay, guys. That was insightful.